I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 26 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the following letter has been received from Senator Green. Pursuant to Standing Order 75, I propose the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. The Morrison government's failure to address job security is giving companies that exploit workers an unfair advantage against honest employers. Is the proposal supported? Thank you. I understand that. <laughs> I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. And I call Senator Green. Well, thank you very much. This is a very important motion uh, for the Senate to be discussing today as we seek to rebuild and recover um, from the coronavirus pandemic. From an economic point of view, what the coronavirus pandemic has shown us is that insecure work can have a significant impact not only on our economy, not only on our society, but also on our public health. The Morrison government's failure to address job security is giving companies that exploit workers an unfair advantage against honest employees. So we know that there are good businesses out there that do the right thing. There are a lot of good businesses that are trying to keep up. But this government's policies have allowed other businesses to exploit workers and undercut good businesses. Then not only do the policies of this government hurt workers, but they hurt businesses that are doing the right thing. There are many examples of exploitation of workers in our country, and a few come to mind. Of course, of wage theft is one of the big, uh, the big exploitations of workers. Wage theft laws in Queensland at the moment uh, were introduced by the Palaszczuk Labor government in its last term of government. And they were fought for incredibly hard by the union movement, by young workers, particularly the Young Workers Hub in Queensland, did a fantastic job of uh, communicating to young people out, um, out there why these wage theft laws were necessary. Because time and time and time again, we saw that the policies from this government was allowing wage theft to occur in businesses all across Queensland. And it was particularly rampant with young workers and particularly rampant in places in southeast Queensland where these wage thefts went unchecked. Uh, in my previous employment, I worked for the AMWU and we had apprentices who, were, who suffered wage theft. And it's a complicated process to go through uh, to get back that money. But the Queensland Labor government's criminalisation of wage theft means that those workers are now protected and that those bad businesses are on notice that you cannot get away with wage theft anymore. We know that the government has uh, introduced a bill that purports to deal with this issue in some sort of way. But make no mistake about it, the federal government's policies will water down the hard-fought wage theft laws in Queensland because they're not as strong. They're not as strong as the Queensland laws. So when you hear those opposite talk about the fact that they want to introduce laws uh, to criminalise wage theft or to do something about wage theft, something that they should have done in every other year of their uh, government, be very clear about what these laws will do. If they will water down the hard-fought wage theft laws in Queensland, then they're not good enough and this Senate shouldn't pass them. And those opposite should not try to mislead people in Queensland that their laws are as strong as the ones already in place. The other form of exploitation that we see most often in Queensland is the use of labour hire to undercut workers' pay. And this comes back to this idea that good businesses do the right thing 
they employ workers directly and they pay them in a permanent uh, basis. But you've got some businesses out there who, under this government's policies, have seen labour hire as a loophole, dodgy labour hire companies as a loophole to reduce the wages and conditions of hard-working Queenslanders. Now, these businesses that do this get away with it because this government has continually not stood up to those businesses. It has become so rampant that now it is a business model in some parts of Queensland to have your workforce employed under labour hire arrangements, sometimes as casual workers, sometimes on short-term contracts. But how can good businesses compete when, you, when other businesses are using labour hire arrangements to undercut workers' pays and conditions? Well, they simply can't. And this government has let uh, businesses like that get away with it. I often hear comments from um, the various uh, LNP MPs and senators uh, in this place and um, back up in Queensland because you will find the government members in the Senate and, and in the House of Representatives from Queensland come down here and say one thing, but once they, once they get back to Queensland, it's a totally different story because they have been under pressure from the Labor movement and from the Labor Party over the last seven years to do something about labour hire. We've had George Christensen out there in 2018 saying, saying, mining companies need to start shifting away from labour hire as unemployment rates plummet or risk being unable to attract workers. Happy to say something like that when you're standing up in, south, in uh, central Queensland, but not happy to come down here and do anything about it. We've had Mad, Mad, uh, Senator Canavan um, who we know has uh, got a real, um, uh, a real flair for dressing up as a miner and uh, smudging um, makeup on his face and pretending as if he cares about the plight of working people. He has said, in my short time in politics, I have had to fight against 100% FIFO and cas casualisation of the mining industry. Well, he hasn't fought very hard. He hasn't fought very hard because this is still going on. It's still going on. And they can make statements like that up in, up in central Queensland and in north Queensland. But when it comes down to here, the policies that you implement, that is what is letting companies get away with this exploitation. Even Scott Morrison was asked in question time what he thought about these arrangements. And whether if you are working next to someone, whether you should get, if you're doing the same job, whether you should get the same pay and workplace conditions. But he wasn't really able to answer that question, was he? The first time, he refused to answer the question altogether. The second time, he just said, oh, it's complicated. Well, that's exactly what Christian Porter said as well last week when he was asked, asked whether gig workers should get the minimum wage. It's complicated. It's too complicated for this government to do the right thing, to step in and protect workers and the good businesses that choose not to exploit them. We know there have been many examples of exploitation in far north Queensland and in central Queensland. Of course, there's the OS services debacle, where BHP literally went out, created a new EBA, got a couple of people in Western Australia to sign up to it, even though it was less than the EBA in central Queensland, then sought to apply that EBA that no one had ever seen to the thousands of workers in central Queensland. And this government's policies has let them get away with it. We know there was a federal court case that tried to intervene to make sure that people who were permanent casuals would have protection, protection under the law. What did this government do? Well, they intervened in the court case, not on the side of the workers, but on the side of big businesses and the company that was seeking to exploit workers. Labor thinks that if you do the same job, you should get the same pay. It's pretty simple. I can come here in here and say that, but the members opposite cannot. Labor has a policy to make sure that if you do the same job, you get the same pay. 
At the moment, there are too many workers in Australia subject to unfair labour hire practices. They're treated like second-class citizens with lower wages, worse conditions and no job security. While there are workers who like the flexibility that labour hire provides, often it's not their choice, not their first choice anyway. Their first choice would be to have job security, to get a good job, to be able to get a mortgage, to plan holidays with their families, to plan for the financial security of their family. But because of this government's policies, they're not able to do that. Labor in government will legislate to ensure that workers employed through labor hire or other employment arrangements such as outsourcing will not receive less pay than workers employed directly. It's a pretty simple idea. Labor's on the side of workers who have been exploited through labour hire under this government's policies. Senator Macdonald. <clears throat> Thank you. Labor lecturing the government on jobs is like someone burning sausages on a backyard barbecue telling Gordon Ramsay he's running his food empire badly. They don't know what it's like to navigate the reams of, leg of legislation and numerous pitfalls involved with awards and human resources. They don't understand the daily stress of ensuring that there's enough work coming through the door, managing cash flow and creditors. They've never had to worry about a militant union accusing them of wage theft because of a simple, innocent error in applying one of the myriad award rates. Labor is the anti-jobs party. And never has the old adage, there's no you in Labor, been more true. In my home state of Queensland, the Labor Party has for years refused to approve an expansion of the new Ackland coal mine, forcing the loss of scores of good, high-paying jobs around Toowoomba. This is even worse when a majority of the surrounding residents want the expansion to go ahead. And let's not forget the Adani Carmichael mine in central Queensland, a project that promises and is delivering stable, high-paying jobs, but also hope for the small towns nearby that were facing a bleak future as the blue-collar jobs they were built on became despised by the new Labor Party. I travel regularly to regional areas to talk to employers and employees, and I can say unequivocally that schemes like JobKeeper and the changes to IR rules that go with it were a godsend for both parties. The other thing we always hear from rural and regional Queensland is that people can't remember the last time they had a visit from Labor politicians at a state or federal level. And rather than parroting lines given them to them by union hacks, I encourage those opposite in the Queensland Labor state government to get out, to go west and north and listen to the people at the front lines. And for Senator Green, apparently it is all pretty simple. But where is the support, not taxes, but support for those people who actually create jobs? Because it is small business that is the lifeblood of our economy and Australia's biggest employer. And unlike, the, unlike Labor, the coalition wants people to earn more, more money and keep more of it. We are the party of creating jobs and giving people the chance to prosper through their hard work. We've also established the Disability Employment Advisory Committee to give even more people in our society the chance to experience the dignity of real work and the ability to earn a wage and to have control over their future. Now, Senator Stirl, who's one of the few on that side who often makes a lot of sense, said just today, everything has the word job in front of it. Job seeker, job keeper, job maker and job trainer. And he's right, because this government puts jobs in front of everything. This government understands that jobs are hard fought for, that they cost blood, sweat and tears, and they're not created by some magical fairy dust, as Labor would have you believe. The Morrison-McCormack government has always had and always will have a zero tolerance for any exploitation of workers. That includes the underpayment of wages and entitlements by any employer. And that's why the Fair Work Ombudsman is continuing to take strong action on behalf of workers despite the, the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. 
In 2019-20, the Fair Work Ombudsman recovered a record amount of money for underpaid workers, $123 million to be precise. They issued 952 compliance notices, recovering $7.8 million in unpaid wages, which is a 250 per cent increase on the number of compliance notices uh, from the previous year. They filed more than double the number of court cases in 2019. 20 compared to 2018-19, and close to 10 per cent more than during Labor's last full year in office, and also secured 163 per cent more in court-ordered penalties in 2019-20, again compared with Labor's last full year in office. They issued 603 infringement notices, an increase of 7 per cent compared with the previous financial year and recovered over $56.8 million in back payments for workers from enforceable undertakings issued. The commitment of the Morrison-McCormack uh, government to this vital cause has remained unscathed despite a global pandemic, evidenced by the fact that within the first six months of 2020-21, the Fair Work Ombudsman has recovered almost $80 million for over 31,000 employees, filed 37 litigations and entered into 12 enforceable undertakings. Moreover, through legislation that is currently before this parliament, the Morrison-McCormack government understands that it is government's responsibility to ensure that an environment exists where Australians can both seek to be employed and seek to be employed. Never has it been more important that this be emphasised, given we are undertaking an economic comeback out of COVID-19. The amendment to the Fair Work Amendment will ensure people can gain employment, stay in employment and thrive in employment. The fact of the matter is that given the current economic environment, businesses, in order to remain competitive in an uncertain and unstable global market, must have the necessary flexibility available to them, acknowledging the special circumstances in which we find in these COVID times. And that's why the government will legislate a two-year extension on temporary JobKeeper flexibilities to businesses in identified industries that have been hardest hit by the pandemic, by giving employers confidence to offer part-time employment and additional hours to employees and promoting flexibility and efficiency. The Morrison-McCormack government, as it always has, remains committed to the assurance of a zero-tolerance approach to any exploitation of workers. The Morrison-McCormack government likewise understands the role it must play in ensuring Australians are able to seek to employ and seek to be employed, because it is only the creation of real jobs, of sustainable businesses that can not just survive but thrive that ensures certainty for employees. And that is the the focus of us all should be the focus of us all as we move forward. It is ensuring that employers are well supported, well resourced and understand that their government seeks to encourage uh, the activities that ensure that they can employ more people, that they have the confidence to be able to employ uh, firstly casual people, move them to per permanent part-time and then full-time as they feel confident that the work remains for those people, that they can uh, support a line of business coming through the door, that they can manage their creditors, that they can survive in an increasingly uh, regulated environment. Because those are the jobs that are genuine and real and should be supported uh, at all costs. I hear Senator Green and others talk about jobs as if they are created magically, and it is not the case. And for those people on the other side who have ever run a business, who have ever had to go through the stress and worry of the commitment of employing somebody, of making that decision of, will I have enough work for them, will I be able to pay them every week, um, that, that is the, the focus for this economy, for this government to ensure that those jobs are real, that those employees have certainty and confidence. And yet, once again, we will hear from Labor. We will hear from Labor about the fantasy land of 
um, of wanting to support jobs but not wanting to support employers, not wanting to walk a day in their shoes, of understanding just how difficult it is to make those commitments to people, to mortgage your home, to worry about uh, to pay everybody else before you pay yourself, because that's the way it is for most small businesses. Most small businesses survive on average for seven years because they are exhausted by regulation, by ensuring there is work coming through the door, of surviving economic upturns and downturns, supply of um, managing uh, uh, seasons, if they're in agriculture, of managing demand, not to mention a pandemic. And yet, we once again have Labor wanting to talk about uh, the, the negative side of employment as opposed to supporting businesses, not talking about taxing them, but supporting business. And I would encourage them to walk a mile in the, in the shoes of small business. Senator Roberts. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. As an Australian who has been elected to serve the people of Queensland and Australia, I am very proud to say that I have worked in many countries and I am genuinely proud, genuinely proud by Australia, of Australian workers. We have a phenomenal human resource in this country, unequalled anywhere in the world. The initiative, the hard work, the honesty, the integrity of workers in this country and many businesses in this country, especially small businesses, the engine room of our economy. More people are employed in small business than in any other sector of the economy. And we need to get the dynamism back that has been lost in Australia, lost largely because of this building and the decisions that come out of this building. So the MPI talks about the Morrison government's failure to address job security and it's giving companies that exploit workers an unfair advantage against honest employers. Let me talk about the example in the Hunter Valley. The exploitation, the abuse and the casual discarding of people tossed on the scrap heap when they're burned out. Casuals who have been exploited in the Hunter Valley by a major mining company, BHP, and one of the world's largest labour hire firms an offshoot of Recruit Holdings from Japan, Chandler McLeod Group. With the complicity of the Hunter Valley Division of the CFMEU, it would not have happened without all three working together complicit. But casuals, let's go back to the root cause. The root, root of casualisation started in small business because employers were so confused with the complexity of hiring people and so confused with the complexity when there was a problem to discuss. And so they went to casuals because it became too hard to deal with disciplinary issues in small business. And quite often we see small businesses having problems with someone who's stolen something out of their business, an employee who's stolen something out of the business, and the small business worker, a small business owner, then trying to simply address that and ends up just paying $8,000, $10,000. We heard last week from the small business, from COSBOA, the Council of Small Business Organisations of Australia, of some companies, some small businesses are paying $20,000 shut up money to go away. The root cause of the insecurity in this country, one of the root causes, is the highly complex, needlessly complex and destructive industrial relations situation. Then what we saw was large companies taking the small business model and using casuals for a try before we buy. In other words, they'd watch the casual worker on their mine site, in their business, and if he or she made the goods, then they would hire them. And that has led to ex extreme abuse of workers in this country. It's led to safety hazards that I've complained about in my submission to the Grosvenor inquiry. But in the Hunter Valley, it led to miners being intimidated, being threatened with loss of jobs if they reported safety incidents. How stupid is a company when that happens? They're losing that, that, prime, in, that prime source of information about their company. I want to give Mr. Bukarika, the national legal advisor for the CFMEU mining division, 
a huge compliment, because in Townsville he had the guts, the integrity, the courage to acknowledge that the Hunter Valley CFMEU is part of the problem at those mines in the Hunter Valley, because they enabled it to happen. I also want to give him, the, give him praise because he said that, that CFMEU has not done enough for casuals. Indeed, they have caused the casual issue in the Hunter Valley and the casual abuse of casuals. And he's admitted that his union will need to do more about it. So what we see is a mess that's been created by, in the past by labour laws that have become far too complex and by the Liberals not addressing this issue in 2016 when they should have. Casuals show the, the pain of people at work. Casuals also are a sign of the failed industrial relations situation. No getting away from it. And what the government is doing in its latest industrial relations legislation proposed to come before the Senate in, in next month is they're shifting the liability for that mess from, small business, from large business to small business. They're helping a couple of large companies ma manage their risk. We've approached this differently. We've gone out to listen. We've written to 80 different organisations, employers, employee e groups, unions, union bosses, welfare associations, organisations, small business groups, and we've asked them for their advice, their views, and they've come and given it. And they've said no one else has invited them to do that. We're the only ones. We have three aims in this addressing this legislation. To ensure security for Australian workers, whether they be small business, large business, and to assure security for small business and large business. Our three aims are protect honest workers, protect small businesses, and restore Australia's productive capacity. And we see the employer-employee relationship as fundamental. It is the primary workplace relationship, and that's what's needed to empower workers. We've got the best workers in the world. And that's what's needed for employers and employees to work together with empowered employees and empl empowered employers, because that is the only way to create jobs. Government doesn't create jobs. As much as the Labor Party talks about it and the Liberal Party talks about it, government does not create jobs. Honest workers create jobs. Small businesses create jobs. Large employers create jobs. Government creates the environment, and the governments, Labor and Liberal, have stuffed this environment this, this country's workplace environment. The Morrison government talks about security and recovery from COVID. How can that be possible when we've got destroyed our, our electricity sector? How can it be possible when we've got one of the worst tax systems in the world? How can it be possible when we're not supplying the right infrastructure? How can it be possible when we haven't got the skills development needed? How can it be possible when we've got over-regulation. Just go and talk to people, not only employers, small or large businesses, but also employees, sick to death of the energy prices, have gone from the cheapest in Australia in the world to the highest in the world, under this government and its predecessors in the, Liberal, in the Labor Party. So instead of propping up the, Labor, uh, uh, the Industrial Relations Club with excessive, needlessly complex legislation, we need to simplify. In fact, I put it to Peter Strong when he was in my office last week. I said to him, regulations are written at the moment for the few people who do the wrong thing, employers and employees. They should be written for the majority of good people, fine Australians, with severe penalties for the bad. We need to turn it upside down. Instead of penalising the 100 per cent with the ridiculous workplace arrangements, we need to penalise the real shonks, the real criminals. Instead of assuming people are bad, employees are bad, employers are bad, we need to free people to produce and we need to penalise and handicap the, those who deserve it. Empowering, not frightening. That's what we need in this country. Empowering, not frightening. What we see at the moment is an IR club, big employers, big as industry associations, Large unions, employee consultants, employer consultants, industrial relations consultants, and above all, lawyers. And again, I come back to the ETU legal advisor in Townsville, Michael Wright, 
and Mr Bukarika from the CFMEU both said we have far too many lawyers involved in industrial relations, and that's why it's a mess. We have to remove that. And they both said they want less lawyers. They want to remove the lawyers. Full credit to the CFMEU Mining Division and full credit to the ETU for saying that. The big companies and the crooks are the ones who make the best out of the Industrial Relations Club because they've got deep pockets. They can, for, they can afford to fund the lawyers and to fund the others who live off the backs of Australian workers. That's where we need to get to a simple workplace relationship. That's what we need to get back to. Will Labor make a commitment to properly and honestly reform IR? Will you? Will the Liberal Party, National Party, make a commitment to properly, honestly reform IR? To free people so that they're free to compete with the people in Korea, China, India, Africa, Malaysia, Singapore. That's the way to get security of employment, by empowering people. One Nation is the party of energy security and affordability. Senator One Nation Roberts, is the party of job security. Your time has expired. Senator Antic. Oh, sorry, Senator Brown. Yep. Apologies. That's Senator all Brown. right. No problem. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I'm pleased to speak on this matter of public importance because the Morrison government's failure to address job insecurity is hurting working families and damaging our national economy. It has become a major structural issue in the Australian economy, whereby people who do not have access to secure work are being left behind by this government. It is fundamentally unfair, not just for workers, but also for those businesses who are doing, who are doing the right thing. Because of the use of certain forms of insecure work gives companies that exploit workers an unfair advantage against honest employers. And the share of workers in insecure work is increasing, continuing to increase. In my home state of Tasmania, we continue to suffer from the highest underemployment rate of any state, 8.9 per cent. There are 37,500 Tasmanians, Mr Acting Deputy President, who simply can't get the hours of work they need to make ends meet. This is not secure employment. This does not enable people to be able to live with confidence, to plan their life, to buy a house or do any of those things that require secure employment and secure finances. Australian workers, our national economy and business will all benefit from more job security because we all do better when we all do better. Better pay and a fairer industrial relations system will reap benefits for everyone in our society, from the top to the bottom. That is the approach Australians can expect from an Albanese Labor government. Not so from Mr Morrison, however. This Prime Minister continues to practice the same old failed liberal economic policies of a race to the bottom, the lowest common denominator. In contrast, Labor believes that secure work is an essential component of being able to build a secure life. Secure work allows workers to take leave when they're sick or need to care for a family or household member without putting their jobs at risk. It means that they can have the confidence to spend money to stimulate the Australian economy, boost growth and create more jobs. And yet good, decent, Secure jobs are becoming fewer and fewer with the rise of insecure employment. Yet this government has no plan to arrest that rise. Indeed, they encourage it. What we have seen in the past 12 months with the COVID pandemic is that insecure work not only poses a risk to individual workers but to our society as a whole. It is the case that when the pandemic began, casuals, who account for about a quarter of the Australian workforce, lost their jobs eight times faster than those in more secure forms of employment. Eight times faster, Mr Acting Deputy President, than those in more secure forms of employment. To rub salt into their wounds, it was an active and deliberate decision taken by this Prime Minister to exclude around one million 
casual workers from access to JobKeeper, forcing many onto Centrelink. Now, that was a measure that the former spe uh, Speaker, Senator Macdonald, didn't mention in her contribution here today, that this government took the deliberate and active decision to exclude one million casual workers, forcing them onto Centrelink. But of course, casual work is not the only form of insecure, insecure work. When you add in many contractors, freelancers, gig workers and those on temporary contracts or working in labour hire, what we see is that nearly half the workforce misses out on the many benefits of a permanent job. And we know that. And who in our workforce, in our society, is more likely to be stuck in insecure work? Women, young people and those from a migrant background. In fact, one thing we have seen from the inevitable recovery in the jobs market after the first recession in Australia in 30 years is that the increase in jobs has been very substantially been composed of insecure jobs. This has implications not only for people in these jobs but for our broader recovery and for our potential future economic growth, because we know that those in insecure work have much less confidence to spend. But these are the things that gov the government can do, can do to combat the uh, Senator Brown, your insecure time work. has expired. Senator Antic. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy uh, President. Uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President, uh, we know we're back uh, in this building when we know that Labor are up to their old tricks. Uh, and I, uh, like most mornings, read this matter of public importance uh, with a degree of, uh, shall we say, uh, sympathy in a sense, because ultimately uh, every day it is for those opposite to concoct a matter of uh, public importance which uh, seeks to uh, attack the government's agenda uh, and, uh, and do so uh, with what would only be described as a limited arsenal. Um, we know that those opposite uh, sit with a, uh, a divided party and a leader who doesn't, doesn't know whether or not he's, uh, he's batting for the woke inner city, uh, inner city types uh, or the workers. Um, and we know that that, uh, that uh, narrative uh, streaks its way all the way through the party. So what do you do in those circumstances? Uh, what do you do in order to try and, uh, to try and face up to that, face up to uh, a government which is led by a prime minister that has seen us uh, through extraordinarily difficult times, a hundred-year pandemic, and done so uh, in circumstances where um, we have cemented our economic recovery. And indeed, today, Mr Acting Deputy President, we learned that we've retained our AAA rating. So it's with a degree of sympathy that I read these, because it is a very, very difficult task. So what does this represent? It represents nothing but gaslighting. Ultimately, that's what it is. It is parliamentary gaslighting. And psychologists use that term to refer to a specific type of manipulation, where the manipulator is trying to use someone, else, uh, someone else's reality to question their own. Um, we do so, and we know that, because they are usually based on lies and they are usually based on matters which are of deep importance, such as uh, the rights of workers. Um, and to suggest that somehow that the Morrison Liberal government uh, has anything but the workers' best interests in mind is, is ludicrous. Um, this government has zero tolerance for any exploitation of workers, and we've seen that uh, with a number of legislative reforms that have come through. Um, it has zero tolerance for the underpayment of wages and entitlements by an employer. And this government has, in fact, taken unprecedented action uh, to date to protect vulnerable workers. Uh, that includes a commitment of over $160 million in additional resourcing to the regulator and the Fair Work Ombudsman. Um, there is no unfair advantage to law-breaking companies in the government's IR reforms. In fact, quite to the contrary, there are significant measures which prevent exploitation of workers and significant penalties for those that do so. Um, this government is continuing to take strong action to protect workers from underpayments with various uh, reforms to strengthen and enhance uh, existing compliance and enforcement regimes that are contained uh, in, in, these, uh, in this bill. But let's compare and contrast that using the example of gaslighting. Um, it wouldn't be the Labor Party blocking these uh, IR reforms that, uh, that would be causing problems, would it? Wait, what's this? Uh, by blocking this omnibus bill, 
Labor is actually seeking to block serious, serious reforms, such as a quicker enterprise agreement approval process through the Fair Work Commission. Um, this, this process would in itself actively help to deliver pay rises more quickly, but the Labor Party are blocking it. The opportunity for more hours for almost 30 per cent of part-time employees for the retail sector and 40 per cent of part-time employees in accommodation and food services sector who want more hours. And we're being told that this government is actually standing in the way of workers' rights. Well, it couldn't be more ludicrous. More job, more job opportunities are being blocked by Labor's position on this, on this legislation by providing certainty for mega job creating projects such as greenfield sites. Um, in fact, if you look at the detail, and we do that on this side of the chamber, we look at the detail, uh, the only side that's proposing to cut wages and cost jobs is actually the Labor Party, those opposite. Two weeks ago, in fact, we heard Anthony Albanese announcing <coughs> his undercooked and disappointing attempt uh, at industrial relations policy, which has nothing to do, nothing in the, in the secret to do with helping employers and employers work together. By contrast, the Morrison government supporting Australia's jobs and economic recovery package of reforms will actually give businesses the confidence they need to get back to growing and creating jobs. Uh, and that is exactly what the Morrison government's industrial relations reforms are, entitled to, are, are, are attempting to um, achieve. And to suggest that this government is failing to address job security is, is either disingenuous or it's just simply missing the point, or, Mr Acting Deputy President, it's simple gaslighting. Senator Sheldon. No, thank you, Acting Deputy President. While there is a job security crisis in Australia, there are more than 2.6 million casual workers in Australia. Now, we understand there is a role for casuals. We understand that permanent employees do not suit everyone in their circumstances. But when one in four workers are casual, it raises serious issues. We have to ask ourselves whether many how, how many Australians of foregoing entitlements like sick leave and annual leave, if they are doing it because it suits their lifestyle or because the type of employment is being used by employers. Used by employers to avoid ongoing commitments of hours, used by, to avoid paying entitlements, the kinds of entitlements that are, in, that are betterment for the Australian workforce, or being used by employers incorrectly to avoid paying these entitlements while extracting the same kind of value from their workforce that they have been from permanent employees. The recent court cases against WorkPAC, championed by the CFMMEU, laid bare the exploitation of casuals in the workplace and that it's rampant. As Senator Roberts has repeatedly raised in this chamber, the exploitation of casual and labour hire coal miners in the Hunter Valley borders on the criminal. Of course, the government's response? Do nothing. Now, it's worse than doing nothing, actually. Their response is to further entrench insecure work, pushing a bill that would create permanent class of casuals, workers who, regardless of how they are treated or the expectations placed on them, will be called to, ca be, called to be casuals day in and day out, completely overturning the outcomes of the federal court that protects casuals protects rights. Entrenching the unfair advantage being provided to those employers who see their workforce not as people deserving of fair remuneration, but rather numbers on a budget line item, a cost to doing business. They only care about the financial cost, not the human cost. You only have to look at the gig economy. Didi Friday, a father with four-year-old son in, in Bali. Zhijian Shen, whose eight-year-old son and 15-year-old daughter are in China, or Chao Kai Shen, a Malaysian national whose parents and sisters are devastated, Bijay Paul, Bijay Paul from Bangladesh, who leaves behind his parents and sister, and Ai Huang, who had only arrived from China to Australia recently. These are the names of the gig workers who have died in the past year on our streets delivering food for companies like Uber Eats and Hungry Panda. These men and workers have families. They have, they, they're in families, and they had been the breadwinners of their families. 
In many cases, these companies have ignored their responsibility to train, protect and assist their workers, hiding behind the facade of terms like contractors, keeping their workers away at arm's length to avoid their responsibilities, their responsibilities to safely, to a fair playing field, to fair pay and remuneration, and to be able to organise collectively. I note that today the Attorney-General in the House during question time was asked about workers' rights, minimum pay and safety. He claimed the two government commissioned reviews had found no clear link between the remuneration and the safety of drivers, except that was a falsehood. The first review by Jaguar Consulting in 2014 found, I quote, a small number of studies have identified statistically significant relationships between driver remuneration and accidents in involvement. And a second, the PwC report from 2016 stated that, I quote, directly comparing remuneration and safety does demonstrate statistically significant correlations. But these are just a handful of all the reports over the years that have established a link between pay and safety. Workers in transport on low rates of pay are forced to work beyond breaking point in dangerous conditions to make ends meet. Every year, more truck drivers die on our roads, whilst this government, the one that abolished the Road Safety Remuneration Tribunal, continues to ignore the link between pay and safety. Well, thankfully, there are some employers and employer groups out there who are prepared to call for action when it's needed to help end the crisis of insecure work. The Australian Road Transport Industry Organisation, in testimony provided to the Senate inquiry this last week, before last called for regulation of the gig economy. The chair, Peter Anderson, rightly pointed out, I quote, the industry sees the oncoming gig economy and the way it's being managed at the moment as a threat to our standard of living and a winding back of employee protections. We would like to see a classification of the industrial relations st status of a gig worker. We believe that simply just simple justification would then be able to lead any jurisdiction and any law in the right direction to ensure that workers are protected accordingly. Organisations like RTO, employer organisation, recognises that further eroding the rights of employees and encouraging greater insecurity of work underpins the competitiveness of employers who do the right thing. Acting Deputy President, it's not just insecure work. But it's, a pro but it's also the byproduct of wage theft that has implications for competition in Australia. The Senate inquiry into wage theft has received 122 submissions, many of which are from employers. One in particular I will draw the Senate's attention to is that of the Cheesecake Shop, a franchisor with some 200 franchisees, cake bakeries across Australia, New Zealand and the United Kingdom. In their submission to the inquiry, they make the exact point, and I quote, small businesses that are compliant face a real threat from non-compliant competitors with a lower cost base. Businesses in their industry face a daily high, high, daily high rise of unfair price competition from employers who do not pay award rates and steal from their workers, who don't make enterprise agreements. As the McKell Institute firmly points out in the 2019 report, ending wage theft, eradicating underpayment in the Australian workforce. Wage theft, that pro theft provides an unfair competitive advantage to some companies. Companies that play by the rules, and I quote from the report, may lose customers, tenders and government contracts to business that commit wage theft and are able to offer, that are able to offer lower prices. Industries such as hospitality and fruit picking where wages make up a large proportion of costs. Business who pay a legal wage struggle financially against those who commit wage theft. Well, isn't the Liberal Party meant to be the party of business? Don't they recognise that insecure work and wage theft are tools used by unscrupulous employers to undermine the success of their competitors? And wouldn't the Liberal National Party be up in arms demanding to do something about those unfair operators? But of course not. They won't act to improve job security. Suggest, suggestions to me that the only business they care about are the ones that are taking advantage of workers, 
and carry out unfair practices amongst competitors. Now, as we enter the recovery stage of the COVID-19 pandemic, there is no doubt that we need to ensure consumer demand will be critical to our economic recovery. But consumer demand relies on confidence. Workers must have confidence in their paychecks, in their working conditions, in meeting the rising cost of living they are going to spend and lift demand. Those businesses who are serious about a COVID-19 recovery must understand the important role that increasing wage growth will play, alongside the need to improve job security. The crisis of job security in Australia is one that can only be met with government action. Too many employers exploit our existing system for an unfair competitive advantage. Without government action, this crisis will only get worse. And of course, that's why an Albanese-led government is committed to a plan to improve job security one that will guarantee greater worker rights and conditions to those workers on the edges of the labour market, creating a rising tide to lift boats in the labour market and for all employers. A Labor government will make job security an objective of the Fair Work Act, extend the powers of the Fair Work Commission to include employee-like forms of work and not abandon gig workers and the casualisation of work, consider proposals for portable entitlement schemes to better support workers in insecure work in consultation with business. Create a fair and objective test for whether someone is truly a casual employee or not. not creating a clear pathway for permanent work. Ensuring some job, same job, same pay. Ending the practices of labour comp law hire companies paying workers less than workers doing the same who are employed directly. Place a limit on the growing use of fixed-term contracts. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Acting Madam Deputy Speaker. And what, what a time to be alive and what a time to see the last 12 months and the way the Morrison government has managed this COVID crisis. It has been a masterclass in economic management. We have managed in the space of a few months, we've got over COVID, we've got 90 per cent of people back in work. We've already got 90 per cent people back in work. Now, if that's not job security, if that's not job security, I don't know what is. And that's despite the fact that the state Labor premiers have been constantly opening and closing, opening and closing, opening and closing borders. You know, I remember at the start of this year, you know, I was talking to some small businessmen at the start, first week of January. In the first week of January, they were fired up. They were waiting for that first Friday night. We were all going to go down, head banging in the pub. And what happens nine o'clock that morning? Uh, the Premier of Queensland shuts the pubs, shuts the restaurants, shuts the theatres. It's like all, and, and as, as well as that, and my barber. My barber lost 1,500 bucks that weekend. That's a threat to job security. That creates uncertainty. That creates unemployment. Now you've got to ask yourself why these state premiers keep flip-flopping on border closes. Because I thought the deal was last year when we shut the country down for three or four weeks and we commit committed to spending over $100 billion, the biggest economic rescue package ever, the biggest economic rescue package ever to make sure that our health system was up to speed to make sure we had enough ventilators, all of that. And I can well remember the Queensland uh, Chief Medical Officer saying once we reopened after the election, funny enough that, that we wouldn't have to lock down again. Well, we went for 130 days with no case of COVID, no COVID cases. We get one case, one case in quarantine, and what happens? Bang, everything's shut again. And of course, you know, we couldn't have the other Labor premiers being outdone, so we got another case in uh, quarantine over in Western Australia. So what did we have to do? That Labor premier had to outdo the Queensland Labor premier and shut down for five days. You know, what's going on here? What's going on with the contact tracing and testing? That is a threat to job security. That is a threat to job security. But you know what is a bigger threat to job security, a bigger example of wage exploitation? Wait for it. Superannuation. Because every week, Nine and a half per cent of the workers' wages are taken from them. They never get to see that money, and it's given to someone in one of the big cities, Sydney or Melbourne, one of those white-collared blowhards who get to manage that money until that person retires. And there's no guarantee of a capital return. There's no guarantee of a capital return. 
And were these people ever asked if they could have 9.5 per cent of their money taken? No. Now, if you look at New Zealand, when there was a referendum there in 1997, they were asked if they wanted compulsory superannuation, and you know what they said? They said N-O, 92 per cent to 8, because at the end of the day, the workers want their own money in their pockets. They want to pay off their house. They want to pay off the hex debt. They might want a speedboat. They might want to actually you know, upgrade their, their semi-trailers or whatever it is. Okay? But that and all that extra compliance by the employer, who now has to go and do a separate payment, you know, that's more compliance for the employer, that he goes, well, OK, well, you know, this just gets harder and harder and harder. You know, is it really worth continuing to employ people here in Australia, or am I going to shift offshore? Am I going to shift offshore? So, you know, if you want to talk about wage exploitation, that's the other big threat. And of course, finally, the last big threat is, of course, unreliable power. Unreliable power. Now, would you employ someone that only turned up to work when the sun was shining and the wind was blowing? No, no. But that is what the people on the left want to do with energy. They just want energy that turns up when the wind is blowing and the sun is shining. How can you run a business when you don't know, when you don't know where your energy is coming from next? Is it which part of Australia you're going to have to wait for the wind to start to blow before you get it coming? You know. And I mean, I want to know. I tell you what. I tell you who's feeling exploited. I tell you who are very worried right now is that town of Gladstone in my home state of Queensland. They are terrified that alum uh, alumina smelter is going to close down because I constantly ask the shadow minister for Queensland resources because Queensland resources are for Queensland people. You know, we've got the whole labour thing going here. How many windmills is it going to take to power that Gladstone aluminium refinery? And he can't tell me. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Senator Brockman. Well, it's always, uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy Prince. Always a challenge in this place to rise after Senator Rennick, uh, and it's such, such 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 an enlightening contribution as always. And I think, seeing as we're talking about this matter of public importance, Madam Acting Deputy President, as you well know, uh, those on the other side love repeating something so many times they think it becomes the truth, but in actual fact, it remains as much as a falsehood as when they first began. Now, is uh, underpayment of wages an issue? Absolutely. And the Fair Work Ombudsman and this government has taken uh, remarkable steps in addressing this as an issue. And there have been a lump number of very significant companies in Australia who have been found to have been underpaying wages. Large companies with large human resource uh, departments, companies like 7-Eleven, Commonwealth Bank, Qantas, Bunnings, Woolworths. Now, these are large companies with very complex, very uh, 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 complex and uh, uh, very well-built human resource systems. Uh, is it wage theft? Do we need to use a pejorative term like wage theft? Well, let's see who else is on the list of those oh. who have underpaid wages. Who else? The ABC. The ABC. the ABC. Again, a large uh, a, a broadcasting government broadcaster with a significant human resource department behind it, also underpaid uh, millions in wages. Now, who else? Who else, who else Senator Scar? Well, I believe Maurice Blackburn. Maurice Blackburn. Now, Maurice Blackburn, a, a law firm that, that bills itself as the, 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 the friend of the worker. It builds itself as the industrial relations experts, the labour lawyers. Uh, and you can write that in two ways and still mean the same thing. And Maurice Blackburn was found to have underpaid wages for hundreds, hundreds of its em junior employees. Now, I don't cast stones. I don't call it wage theft. I say maybe we've got a systemic problem. Maybe we've got a systemic problem. Maybe we've got a problem where our award system is actually so complex that the largest, most sophisticated human resource systems in Australia cannot get this right. And we expect small businesses. We expect small businesses where the human resource department is one person. It's the husband or the wife. It's the brother or the sister. 
It's an employee who's, who's, who's handling three different parts of the business. We expect those small business human resource departments, they're not departments, they're individuals. They're individuals trying to struggle to keep up with a system that is extraordinarily complex. Now, are companies that do the wrong thing uh, uh, a, a target for this government? Absolutely. This government is actively working to strengthen protections for employees, to strengthen criminal offences for dishonest and systematic underpayments of one or more employee. We're increasing penalties. Uh, four years imprisonment, in fact. Now that is a pretty significant penalty uh, in anyone's book. $1.11 million worth of fines. Again, a very significant penalty in anyone's book. Increasing the maximum civil penalties for underpayment. New prohibitions to stop employers from advertising for jobs with pay rates below national minimum wages. And clarifying that the courts can make adverse publicity orders where appropriate. But Labor's not going to support this. Now why? They might say, oh, it doesn't go far enough. Fine. If they need to mollify their union mates, that's all well and good. But these changes directly impact the, benefit, the well-being of employers across Australia in a system that is undoubtedly overly complex. And again, I ask all senators to think about those mums and dads, those small business owners, those single employees who have to operate in this environment, an environment of extraordinary complexity, and an environment where the likes of Maurice Blackburn, the Labor lawyers, cannot get this right. Thank you, Senator Brockman. The time for the discussion has expired.